All right. And as we get started and people keep trickling in, go ahead and write um, some thoughts of what you might want to talk about in the chat. And otherwise, I have uh, I do have things to talk about. But if you guys have questions or thoughts, put them in the chat and we will jump in and get started. All right, best way to engage potential buyers at an open house. We have some people who are open house gurus in here. So what do you guys think about what are the best ways to engage from an open house? Uh, so I re so I did this Buffini training. So he has this whole clip about open house. And basically um, what does he do is like he welcomes everyone who walks in the door and then he has a bunch of questions, which we have similar questions is in the PC to a kit, like, you know, have you seen an order open houses and blah, 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 like you can check these questions. But basically what he does, what I like, after end of the open house, um, he gets the information of the possible buyers. And then he has this buyer's questionnaire and he says like, okay, so uh, if it's all right with you, I can, um, uh, you can uh, put down your information in the, and I will send you this buyer's questionnaire. So to find out, um, you know, what are you looking for? So I really like how he hooks up the people this way uh, because it's not that pushy. It's still like in just, um, you know, in a, getting to know you phase, but also, yeah. Oh, Lisa, I'm gonna mute you. He asked this question that if you're working with an agent, obviously if, if someone is working with an agent, then he's not gonna do that. But I think it's a nice way to like um, get someone contact information if you like offer, you have a bunch of questions, a couple of questions and say like, okay, I will send you my buyer's uh, questionnaire. And then I will follow up with you in the next couple of days. Um, I think that's a great way to get someone's contacts. Yeah. So um, essentially we want to be coming from contribution, right? So it's something that is something that you have to offer. And so they're saying, oh yes, I'm willing to give you my information because I want what you have to offer. So um, the buyer's questionnaire might be if you have somebody who is ready and excited to be starting to look. Um, I would also have something ready to go along those same lines of like, what are the most important um, questions to ask when you're looking to buy a house? Or what are important questions to ask your agent or things like that, that would be of value to your clients. And one thing I would say is <clears throat> I'm actually creating something like this for my own clients of like, um, you know, 15 questions to ask your real estate agent or for like to, how to interview your agent or something like that. And basically I'm just Googling and coming up with some of the best questions that I think. And then I am sending that out to people. So um, it, it doesn't have to be something that you already know you're the expert in. Keep that in mind. It doesn't, you know, you don't have to be like, well, how do I know? You know, because you have us to ask, you have Google to ask, you have all these people um, to figure out what are people looking for and what do they really want to know? And then when you come from contribution and say, hey, I'd love to share this with you, then they're saying, okay, now I'm willing to give you my phone number, my email address, and all that kind of thing. I like that. What are some other ways that you guys do it? What are some other ways that you um, engage buyers at an open house? I also want to try out because I will having an open house this weekend and I'm going to try out if I can bring um, a financial person. How do you call that? The lender? Yes. <laughs> to the open house. Uh, and I think that's a great way uh, to also engage with. Uh, yeah. Bringing a lender is a really good way because then they're able, because Everybody wants to talk to, everybody wants to know how much they can afford. Everybody wants to be able to do that. And if you have a lender on site who's willing or who's able to give that them that information, yeah, um, they're going to be able to engage with them in a different way. So if they don't want to engage with you as the agent, they're going to be able to engage with the lender. And then one way or another, you're going to be able to capture that information. 
So it's the same kind of thing coming from contribution, giving them something that is of interest for them. Maria and Luke, I want to hear from you guys. What do you do at open houses? <laughs> I've not been uh, successful in that area as far as engaging buyers, but I really like open houses just because I send out mailers to all the houses around it and then afterwards have a soul and like, so I've gotten more calls that way than um, I still haven't. I've gotten one buyer that I'm still in contact with out of, you know, three open houses. So um, that's okay. Think about, I mean, think about the difference with that and um, door knocking or cold calling. Not to say that those are not also valuable ways to do it, but when you talk about, you know, holding three open houses and you have one active buyer, we've had a few people who have had one open house and they get somebody who wants to write an offer right then and there and writes it with them. So, you know, like it's all a numbers game. Real estate is all a numbers game. And so you want to make sure that you're holding enough open houses and meeting enough people and getting in front of those buyers and open houses are a really good way to do it. So, you know, thinking about, how much time you're putting in time and effort you're putting in for an open house, as opposed to how long would it take you in door knocking or cold calling to do the same kind of thing. So open houses are a really good way to get those numbers up, those engaged buyers. Yeah. Yeah. I, I love the open house because of all the exposure you can get for yourself. Yep. I, exactly. I haven't found that key thing that I, I get a lot of resistance to people even signing in and, they give false emails and yeah. I'm just well, like, and that's, you know, that might be the key too, is being able to come from contribution and say, Hey, I'm going to send you this. And then they will be, it's something that they're intrigued by and saying, Oh yes, I want that. Then they're going to give you their information as right. opposed to if we're saying, Hey, sign in. And what they know from the past is these people are just going to bother me. So, you know, one thing I was thinking about though, we tell you, Follow up, follow up, follow up. It's so important. Follow, after an open house, the main thing to do is follow up. And after your cold calls and after your door knocking and after your clients and when you have past clients and all of that, follow up is so important. I was thinking, I have purchased two houses in the last few years. And I, so like not, I've been interested in, I've actually purchased, although I have gone to open houses, I have put my name in there. I have done all of those things before I was even an agent. I would do those things. Do you know how many people I've heard from? I was just thinking about this the other day, including my agents who helped me buy a house. I have heard, I have been followed up with by one agent and I don't hear from them anymore. They stopped following up with me. Obviously I'm an agent now. So maybe along the ways I told them that I was an agent. I don't remember, but out of all those times that I was looking at houses and purchasing houses and all of that, these people don't follow up with me. If they followed up with me, they would have so much more of my business, my referrals. I would be doing so much more to help them get business. I mean, if I wasn't an agent, but the fact that they just, nobody follows up, that is the norm. That's the norm for real estate agents is I do one deal with you. And then I never talk to you again and hope that you call me. Well, why would I call you if you're not like, if you're not top of mind, I'm not, I probably am like, I don't even remember your name anymore. So following up is huge because it will set you apart from all these other agents. Lisa, you have a question or a comment or something to add? Of course I do. <laughs> um, of course you do. How did you pick, how did you pick the agent you chose? Um, actually both, both times were some kind of, um, online referral thing. One time it was Zillow and one time it was, um, I don't even remember, but I know for sure it was through some kind of online thing. So that's kind of funny is to think that is, and when I first started, I remember being like, oh, Zillow's great because you get people like me who walk in and say, yep, I want this house. This is what I want to offer. These are the terms, blah, blah, blah. The reality is that is not the case. Most people are just looking. Most people are just like wanting to waste your time, but following up with them is key. So even, you know, we don't tell you to do Zillow leads or anything like that, because for the most part, you know, we say don't spend money until you make money. So eventually, yes, you can spend money on these leads and whatever, 
but don't spend money until you make money. In the beginning, you're not wanting to pay for these leads because most of them are not going to pan out. So like we say, it's a numbers game. And so you want to make sure that you have those numbers coming in. And if you do have those kind of leads, then you're going, hopefully going to make a sale, but the key is following up because even those people who are paying for those leads, they have to be paying so much money to get my business. They got my business, but they're not following up with me. One of them too, I told them that I was an investor and I would be purchasing more and they still didn't follow up with me. (laughs) So it's, Following up is so, so, so important. And when we talk about doing open houses, it's super important to follow up with open houses. Maria, um, I want to hear from you about open houses, our open house queen. (laughs) Um, Well, usually when they come in, I give them the house information. I, you know, have my flyer with all my information in there. And then I let them walk through the house. I don't follow them uh, around or anything. Um, if they are interested in want to ask some questions, you know, I'm available. I just don't ignore them. Like, oh, you know, <laughs> walk around and that's it. So at the end, once they're finished, I ask them if they have any questions and if they're interested, um, they will let you know, like I've had some open houses where I'm talking to a client and there's two more waiting for me to finish with this client so they can ask more questions. So if they are interested and if they want to work with you, they will wait and they will give they give you their information. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And just follow up. Like you said, mm-hmm. I, I still have some clients or some leads from like a year ago that I'm still following up. And even though they're not ready, but they're still answering me, which is, you know, good. Um, and that's it. Yeah. Cause eventually they will be ready eventually they will be ready and they're going to go with somebody who is following up with them, who's reaching out. They're going to think of you as their agent, as opposed to somebody who they walked into an open house, who doesn't follow up, who never talked to them again. They're not going to remember that person. And I will say, remember I said, there's one person who was following up with me. That was an agent from an open house that I walked into. So, you know, like there are agents that do follow up and that's good, but it's one out of I'm talking like I probably, I mean, I have worked with probably a hundred agents in the past or not worked with them, but like gone into open houses and written my info down and one out of a hundred is following up with me. That is terrible. So we want you guys as agents to know that follow-up is key. You have to just be in that follow-up. Anybody else, any comments on open houses? Ross, did that help? I uh, did. That did. Yesterday, I went and visited six in a part of Burbank. I know very well. I grew up there, and uh, I noticed the agents were everywhere from attentive to didn't even care if someone came in or not. It's kind of kind of ran the gamut. But I but as far as follow up goes, because I, I introduced myself as agent to everybody. One of the agents emailed me this morning, at, following up to see if I had a buyer for them. So I thought that was a very good follow-up. The rest, I don't know if I'll hear from or not. I gave them all my card and my information, but I did see that. Everything from attentive and then letting people go through the house to not even looking up when people came in. So that I'm keeping that in mind because I have my first one this Saturday. So yeah. they get a good, good feedback on everything. Yeah. And I'm like Maria in, in that way. Oh, sorry, Carlos. I saw that. Um, I'm like Maria in that way where personally I say, you know, welcome, you know, take a look, here's a little bit about the house. Take a look around. Let me know if you have any questions when they come back down, what questions did you see? I like to try and point something specific out about the house. Like I've done open houses where they're clearly fixers. So I'm not trying to say this house is gorgeous and beautiful and stunning. I'm saying, Hey, this house has so much potential. Let me know what you would do with that primary bathroom in there. So, you know, like, or I'm saying like, check out that view from that bedroom, something that is highlighting something in the house so that when they come back down, I have something to engage them with. So, um, I want to make sure that that's something that I'm kind of like trying to figure out what is there that I can point out about the house. Cause in most every house, there's something to point out. Um, Or like I said, something to say like, oh, this has so much potential. What would you do with that hideous master bath? Or, 
you know, whatever. Um, I probably wouldn't say that, but you know what I mean? Um, and then also I think that a lesson in what not to do. I had an agent before I was an agent, like right before I got my license, I went into this house and it was a three-story house by the beach. And so she was in like the second level or whatever. And I came in the bottom level, was looking around, walked upstairs, looking around. She was there in the second level. And then she started talking to me. Then she starts following me around everywhere. She followed me everywhere we went, which I hate. And we tell people, um, for safety purposes, you don't want to follow people around. You don't want to be in the same room as them. You want to have like an exit strategy. And so I don't like that period, but she was following me everywhere, like on top of me. Then she literally started giving me a massage, like rubbing my shoulders. And I was like, what is happening right now? And I was like, uh, okay. And she's like, oh, isn't this so nice? Cause we were like up on the roof or something. And she's giving me a, like rubbing my shoulders. And I was like, um, uh, no, not so nice. Then we go back down and she's asking me, do you want to buy this house with me? Let's go in on it together. And I was like, oh my God, what? she was just strange, very strange. And granted, maybe I said something to bring this out in her, but I don't know what I would have said to make her think that I wanted a massage. And so don't touch people in your open houses. <laughs> Let's draw the line there. Um, maybe a handshake, but even in this post COVID world, maybe not. So, um, just know, use your common sense. Don't be a weirdo about it because that girl was a weirdo. And, but I also thought if that girl can be in real estate, <laughs> then we, we can do this. <laughs> we can all do this. <laughs> so anyway, Carlos, uh, what were you going to say? Um, I was going to just say that at the very end, when they're done looking at the house, um, I'll end up asking them, oh, how long you guys been on the market looking, you know, and then uh, that usually generates uh, a good response and then we can dialogue from there. Yeah, that's true. There are a few kind of scripts that you can use that will, that give you a little bit of insight. So how long have you been looking? Are you working with an agent? Um, what kind of house are you looking for? I always like to ask what brings you in today or how did you hear about us? Because if they say, oh, I saw on Zillow, that probably tells us that they're actively looking at a real estate site. If they said, oh, I was just driving around and we saw an open house, something to do. Okay, great. They're probably just out looking around, looking for something to do on a Sunday, um, which is still okay. I don't want to, you know, like brush them off if they're not, you know, even if they are just looking around. So, um, but it does give you a little bit of insight. And so that's same thing with that question of how long have you been looking? Oh, we just started looking or we've been looking for a few months. It tells you, okay, this is a serious buyer. So I like that kind of motivational question. I, uh, I feel like, I just want to add something. I feel like um, uh, both, uh, so I think it's like, you should find a balance. I mean, I haven't done the open house yet, but I'm figuring like, because some people need need more attention. So you kind of have to know personalities. So I feel like if someone walks in and they have a bunch of questions, might, it might be okay to walk with them and show them and spend more time with them. But you kind of like kind of feel it when someone wants to be like, okay, I want to do my own thing. And some people like that attention. So I don't think it's always good to just let them walk around. I think it's like, you just have to kind of feel them out and feel personalities, different personalities. <clears throat> I agree. Some people do want a little bit more attention and that kind of thing. Um, and you always want to make sure that you are keeping yourself safe. And so for, for me and my own purposes, I usually don't ever go into any bedrooms at all, period. End of story. Even if they want a lot of information, I might follow them to the, you know, like, where the door for the bedroom is and they can go in the bedroom. I'm not going into a bedroom with them. Um, usually what I'll do is even somebody who wants a little bit more attention is I'll walk them around the main spaces. Like, let me talk you through the kitchen and living room and whatever, talk to you, give you more information about the house in the main living spaces. And then I'll say, go check out the you know, go check out the upstairs or go check out the bedrooms and let me know what you think. So I still will 
send them off, even if I'm giving them more of that attention. Part of that is safety. Part of that is because I do want them to have some time without me. Because even if they're engaged, they may just be humoring you. And then they may say like, oh, that was too much. Um, and it's all about your, your personality too. If you're somebody who's a little more hands-off and a little bit more like, let me know what you think, then that's great too, because you don't have to be all things to all people. Um, if you're somebody who's a little bit more engaged with that and want to be doing that, I would say, great, you do you. You just don't want to be, you don't want to be so involved that you're turning somebody off. And you also don't want to be so disengaged that you're also turning people off. So like what Ross said, when, you know, I've definitely been to a lot of open houses where you walk in and the agent doesn't even look at you or they say, Hey, and go back to whatever it is they're doing. And I think that's a turnoff for me. Um, but I also, I don't like it when people walk around with me at all. So I think it's a balance and I think you're right. You need to just feel it out and see what they're interested in and what they want to do. But you just got to check that out. And I think it's how it's handled because uh, there was one senior agent, I think he'd been aging about 35 years on a one house I went to very nice over $2 million house. When I went in and introduced myself, he said, would you like a tour of the house? And then I said, sure. And then he took me on a tour, but I was around there for a while. And I noticed with other people, he was just welcoming and bringing them in and letting them go around. So you're right. You do have to do a little bit of a read on who's coming in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good. All right. One more thing. Do you recommend this like uh, before the open house, before you open it to the public, do you recommend this like only just for the neighbors showing to the neighbors, like maybe an hour before? I do like to do that. I like to do like a neighbor's exclusive open house just because um, it gives you an opportunity to go to go around and talk to the neighbors and it gives you an opportunity to meet with the neighbors and have a little bit more of a dialed in conversation. So sometimes it's not um, like logistically, it's hard to work out, but if you can do that, I think it's a great idea. Well, I think they would appreciate it too, knowing that there's going to be an open house and you're just being courteous and letting them know, you know, we might be, we're expecting some cars here in the uh, neighborhood and yeah, and that's a good opportunity, I think, to talk with them too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. It just gives you an, another opportunity to connect. So I did have a question on the uh, on the open house and, and walking people around. Don't you really want to be in the main area to greet people as they come in? I mean, someone walks in and there's nobody there, unless you know you do it with another person in that way. At least one of you is always covering the front. But that's the reason I would think I wouldn't want to walk around with someone because I want to be there to check great other people coming in. Yeah, I agree. And, and it is different if you're working with another agent or working with a lender or something, somebody's there. Um, one thing that we always do say too, especially in this time is make sure that you're being safe. And one of those ways of being safe is really to go with someone else. So even if that's like your mom, sister, brother, neighbor, friend, um, have them come with you and then they can greet people as, as if you're, you know, talking to somebody or walking somebody around it, that's not always possible and you don't always have that, but just safety wise, it's important to remember that. Emily, were you going to say, add something? I was just going to ask you just not put out your signs. Well, if you're going to do a neighbor exclusive, because I mean, people are just going to see those signs and keep walking in or do you just go ahead and put them out anyway? And you just say that it's a neighbor exclusive. So basically what I have done in the past is I say it, I, um, let them know that it's going to be neighbor ex exclusive from like 10 to 11. And then on all of the marketing materials, I say the open house is going to be from 11 to three or something. So then I would put the open house signs up before for the neighborhood ones. I don't remember what time I said, but for the neighbor one, I would put the open house signs up and then yeah, 10. And then, um, but for marketing and those kind of purposes, I would say that the open house is from 11 to whatever time. So if people happen to come in because they saw the sign, that's okay too. But, um, I would put those signs up just to help even the neighbors know, like, yes, you're in the right place. Yeah. Good. Good conversation. 
Do you think the best time to do open house is in the morning? Because I'm thinking to do it one to four. Is that too late? Um, I think it just depends on what you're able to do and what you want to do and the area and all of that. I don't think, um, I think any time is a good time. Usually, um, if you're doing like a twilight open house, like a four to six or six to eight or something like that, it's to show off the, uh, like if you have a house on the water and you want to show the sunset or you, there's usually a reason that you're doing a later open house, but one to four is still a normal time to do an open house. But outside of the normal times, I usually do it for a reason. But if, um, like if you're doing it on a Monday from 10 to four, I think that's totally fine too, because you're, especially if you have a listing or if it's a vacant listing or something like that, anybody who walks in that door is going to be motivated who comes on an off day. So they're not necessarily somebody who's just wandering around looking for open houses to attend for fun. So I say anytime is really a good time. And one to four is a pretty standard time still. Thank you. Uh, so I was thinking you should bring your dog, Brittany, to your open house to protect you. <laughs> he would not. He would be afraid of everybody. <laughs> I would like to. I have thought about it before, but he's too timid and scared. And like, if there are too many people, he'd be like, ah, I'm scared. I have been to open houses, though, where they do have dogs. And I think it's adorable. But some people don't like dogs. So it's you know, it's a gamble because if somebody doesn't like dogs, that would turn them off. Um, so I have thought about that before. <laughs> All right. Anything else? No. All right, cool. Well, I actually was, um, uh, going to talk about something that something from quantum leap today. And then this morning I got, I looked I have like a daily newsletter that comes and I had a, um, an article that came that I thought was really good and poignant for what we're talking about. So I wanted to share that with you. So I think if you go in, I just shared it on the, um, the link on the chat. And so if you can, if you go in, you should be able to see it's Drew Riley, hundred personal philosophies. And so I just wanted to talk about some of them that caught my eye. And I wanted to share this with you because I think that it is, um, especially for us in real estate, so often we need to, um, in, we need to be the ones who are self-motivating. And so reading this kind of thing and remembering some of these principles are key. So I'm going to read some of them. And if some of them pop out to you, I want you to just jump out and read what you think is interesting to you. Um, and there are a hundred of these, so we're not going to go through all hundred, but I think that it's just, it was a, it was just a good thing to read through. And I liked what it had to say. So, um, we always, we have lots of stress in real estate, right? We feel like ugh, there's so much going on. And so even just this first one, focus on what you can control. I talk about this so often. You can only control you. You cannot control your clients, you can't control the other agents, you can't control what other people are doing, you can only control you. And so if you focus on that, that's going to be so super helpful for you in just knowing that you can really, there's nothing you can do outside of what you are already trying to do to manage the situation. So if you're saying that um, you're, you're dealing with an agent who's really hard to work with, there are some things that you can do to manage that situation. And sometimes it's going to be out of your control. So when we say we can only control ourselves, it's going to make, it's going to release us from what we are, um, feeling and stressed out about this too shall pass. This is something that is like, uh, so um, apropos for real estate, because we feel like, especially when we're new agents, we feel that overwhelming feeling. We feel like we're not going to, um, ever get this. We feel like, you know, these contracts are so tough, but if we remember this too shall pass the struggle that we're in, it's, it's going to go, it's going to go away. We're not going to have it forever. Um, 
and I like what it has to say here. There, there are more things likely to frighten us than there are to crush us. We suffer more in imagination than in reality. And I think that's so true. Was somebody jumping in to say something? Oh, but well, I, I was just saying that's, that's exactly, you know, you just, I, my mind always goes to, oh, what if my, you know, client is going to sue me over this, you know, and I'm just like, and then I look around at all the agents. I'm like, how many of them have ever said that that's happened to them? So, right. It's just... <laughs> yeah, exactly. I love that though, where it's like, uh, we suffer more in our imagination than in reality. I know I do that because I think of the 10,000 things that could happen. Like you're saying, I jump to like 10 million steps ahead saying like, and then I'll be sued and then I'll lose my license. And then, and in reality, if we focus on that constantly, we're never going to move forward. So even when we talk about like, oh, what if even just the little things, what if we call somebody and they don't want to hear from us? who cares? Then we move on. We keep moving forward. This too shall pass. And so, um, you know, like just having that mentality of what is the suffering is more in our imagination than in reality. It's something that we can just move on from. And it's really, really not going to be, we're going to look back at it and say, why did I even stress out about that? You know, one of the things that we've talked about before is, um, is basically looking at something and thinking, if this is not going to be a big deal in five years, then why am I wasting five minutes on it right now? So if in five years, we're not even going to think about this person who is, you know, going to hang up on us on the phone, then why are we even giving it two more seconds of thought? Just move on and let it go. Not wanting something is as good as having it. If you don't want something, you're just, you're just as satisfied as someone who has it. Desire is a contract that you make with yourself to be unhappy until you get what you want. This is, I liked this because I feel like this is something that we, um, I, I think we think about this in real estate a lot because, well, I know I do, I shouldn't speak for everybody, but I think about all of the things that I could have or should have, or even like, um, that real estate money can buy you. But if you don't, if you're not thinking about that, you're not going to be unhappy until you're not going to be unhappy that you don't have it. And so if we're just okay with what we have right now and still pushing to go forward, we're going to be more satisfied. And that stress level is going to be de decreased. So moving on to the productivity, getting it done. We keep it PG around here. Perfection is a myth. Make a choice. Start and iterate. This is something that we talk about. Um, we've talked about a lot is just pick up the phone and make your calls. Just get it done. It doesn't matter if you have the perfect script. It doesn't matter if you have the perfect video. It doesn't matter if you have the perfect whatever. Perfection is a myth. Just get it done. And so I really like this because um, I, I know what is the one saying that I always say? It's something like, um, oh, done is better than perfect. So that's like Facebook uses that. All kinds of businesses use that. And when we look at these big businesses who use that, it's like what they run on is not by making something perfect. It's by getting something done. And so you want to make sure that you're moving forward and getting it done. You don't want to move forward willy nilly. You want to have a plan and, and move forward, which is why we focus on your business plan. But getting it done is so much better than waiting until it's perfect. If you wait until it's perfect, it's never going to happen. Use models. Don't recreate the wheel. Learn from others and save time. We talk about use models all the time. That's like what Keller Williams is built on using models. Don't reinvent the wheel. You don't need to come up with your own scripts. You don't need to do that. That's why we have the PC agent toolkit for you is because we say we've already done the work for you. Use the models, use what we have. Any thoughts on any of these before we keep going? I have a thought and I did the TikTok video this weekend. And yeah. 
<laughs> and you saw it, I sent it to you. But the problem is, I don't know why I had that screen, it says create. So, oh, I couldn't take it off. So basically that's perfect for this quote. It says like, just do it. What I've done is better than perfect because it's totally an imperfect TikTok thing. But at least I did it. <laughs> at least you did it. And we learn. We learn every time we do it because now you said, okay, how do I get rid of that? Now you can figure out how to get rid of it. And now you've learned more of what you can do on TikTok. So I love that. That's a great example because it's just about getting it done. Press record, get it done. It doesn't matter if it's perfect. It doesn't matter if, you know, you have the perfect script. It doesn't matter. Just pick up the phone, make the call, press record, make the video, do whatever you need to do to get it done. I love that. Start super simple. Make the simplest version first. Don't compliment things. Compliment. Don't complicate things. Um, so when we talk about this, you want to make sure that um, I think that this happens all the time for our agents is that they think that they need to have everything done. This is akin to what is your one thing? work backwards until you figure out your one thing. What is your um, most simple next step? Do that. Do the simplest thing first. Don't complicate things. Now, of course, we talk about when you have like a whole list of things to do, do the hardest thing first, because that's what is going to motivate you to keep going. Um, or at least if you have the hardest thing done, then you can move on and everything else is easier after that. But when we talk about just start, start super simple. Don't overcomplicate things. We tend to overcomplicate things so much as humans, as entrepreneurs, as business people, as business owners, we overcomplicate it. And we don't even think about starting super simple. We think I have to have it perfect before I even get started. So start super simple. I like this next one. Read and listen to whatever you're most interested in. We get more out of what interests us. So find something you enjoy reading instead of struggling through books. Um, I like that because, you know, I read all kinds of nonfiction books and there are some that I'm like, this is so boring or this is so terrible or I hated this. Read and listen to what you're interested in. And I would say we talk about that too with do what excites you when it comes to lead generation. So if you don't want to go door knocking, don't door knock. But what are you going to do that interests you? If you don't want to make cold calls, don't cold call. What are you going to do though? You can't just say, I'm not going to do anything and expect for like deals to come your way. That's not going to happen. You have to put in the work. You have to put in the effort, but what are you going to do? Are you going to say, I'm going to focus on open houses and I'm going to kill these open houses and follow up and get those buyers. Okay, great. If you do that, then you have to do uh, your door knocking is going to look like door knocking around your open houses, but you don't have to go door knocking to random neighborhoods. If you say, I'm going to be the door knocking king or queen. Great. Do door knocking and kill it, but do what you're interested in. It's the same kind of thing as what we're talking about with the open houses today is that like, I am not interested in following everybody around. So I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do what interests me. What interests me is talking to people as they walk in the door and getting excited about what they're excited about. That's what interests me. So that's what I'm going to do. The best returns in life come from compound interest. This applies to relationships, habits, and business. So we all know about compound interest with um, regard to money, but think about compound interest in regards to relationships, habits, and business. I really like that idea because it's um, talking about, you know, like you compound when you create your habits and when you start small, there's a compound interest that comes from that. It compounds your habits. As you create these small little habits, they grow and grow and grow into these habits that make you super successful. Same thing with business. When you have the one business venture, or when you have your one house that you're going to sell, that turns into all of these other um, buyers that might be interested, sellers that come to you from that one sale of the house, all of that kind of stuff compounds and it grows. Successful people say no to almost everything. What does that mean to you guys? It means you don't overcommit just to say yes to people. 
You don't just say yes, yes, yes. I've worked with people in the past that did that and then they couldn't accomplish anything. Yep. Yeah, you I have agree. to use your time wisely. So you just like say yes to things what it actually benefits you and you have to say no to things what it doesn't. I really. Yeah. And I think that, at, you know, in the beginning stages of your real estate career, you are feeling like I have to say yes to everything because I felt like this. I felt like I have to say yes to everything to see where my business is going to land. And so I was saying yes to selling land, to selling um, investment properties, to selling fixer uppers, to selling anything because and anywhere. So the, but the more successful we get, the more we're able to focus, the more we don't have to say yes, because we need the money, the more we're able to focus and say, actually, you know what, that, you know, 20 miles away is too far for me. So I'm going to refer you to an agent out that direction. Successful people say no to almost everything because they niche down. They know where their focus is. I love that. But remember, that doesn't have to be right away. You, you don't want to be known as um, the agent who won't work, who won't do anything. You want to make sure that you're still working and doing stuff. But as you as you are more successful, you need to say no to more and more things. And I feel like that sometimes is the opposite of what people think. People think like, oh, I can say yes to everything that's going to make me successful. But the opposite is true. We have to learn to say no. Um, get, it, get it working by any means. So basically we're saying get started, get working by any means necessary. So just do it. To me, this is another, um, this is another iteration of just do it. Like perfection is the enemy. Just get it going, get it working and start moving forward. And part of this is, um, you want to make those tweaks after you, you want to improve things after you start doing it. So Adina, like what you're saying, you did the TikTok, and now you know that you need to make some changes. You did some of those things and now you're going to make those tweaks. So get it working, get it moving, get it started, and then make some of those changes. Um, hire and build when it hurts, set goals and work back backwards. That's something that we talk about is use big goals and small goals. Milestones can expose whether you're undershot or overshot. So if you're saying, um, I'm going to I'm going to sell 150 houses this year. And then once you get to four months, you're saying, oh, I needed to sell. If I wanted to sell 150 houses this year, I needed to sell like 10 a month. And at month four, I've only sold four houses. Great. Now we see, we probably overshot that. Maybe let's course correct. And whether that means I'm going to adjust my goals or whether that means I'm going to adjust my output, um, you're able to have those goals and work backwards. That's what we talk about when we create our goals in command. We say, okay, we have this big goal that we're working towards. So if we say, I want to make a million dollars, that's great. But if we get started and we say, hmm, to make a million dollars, I need to be selling all these houses and I'm not quite there yet. Okay. Now let's scale back and say, how about if I make a hundred thousand dollars, what's going to happen? What do I need to do to make a hundred thousand dollars this year? Then all of a sudden things seem manageable. But we don't, whatever your goal is, we don't want to necessarily shrink your goal. Whatever your goal is, we want to set that goal and then work backwards to say, okay, how many conversations do I need to have to accomplish that goal? So set your goal and then work backwards. Um, I want to skip some of these because I want to go to... Um, uh, let's see. Wisdom, growth. There, oh, here we go. Business, delivering value. Start with problems, not solutions. Start by studying the problem and start instead of offering solutions. Study the lock before you make the key. So if we look at our real estate business and say, where are the gaps that we're finding? Where are the um, pain points of people's transactions? And then we can say, let's figure out how to fix that. Then you're coming with the solution, but you start with the problem. You don't want to start by saying, here's how we fix everything. And really nobody was asking you to fix that. 
you want to start with saying, where are some of the pain points? Where are my clients' frustrations? And go to create those solutions. Frustration is an opportunity. Keep an idea journal. Jot down your problems. Some businesses, some are business opportunities. I love this because this is basically the same kind of thing of start with problems, not solutions. So if we say, for example, the thing that pops into my head is um, you are uh, working with people who are feeling like, oh, I just am trying to sell my house and I can't sell my house in this market. And then you become an investor and start buying those that frustration for your clients turns into an opportunity for all of you. So just think about like, keep that, I like that, keep that idea journal and figure out what could potentially turn into a business opportunity. What are those pain points for people that you can help um, fill and then maybe turn it into a new business venture? One of the nice things about real estate, this is actually part of what we, I was going to talk about um, and we'll probably talk about again in some of our coachings, um, is just talking about how real estate, starting as a real estate agent can really open the doors for a lot of other business opportunities. And so you want to keep your eyes open for some of those business opportunities that are ancillary businesses to real estate. So maybe it's property management, maybe it is um, interior design, maybe it is TC, maybe it's a notary, maybe it's mortgage, whatever it is, there are lots of people who've started out as a real estate agent and have scaled in different ways to grow different businesses. So that is a really nice thing about the real estate industry is that you can do that. Um, the most important part of business is the market. It's easier to ride a wave than it is to make one. So this is one of those things that I, I'm going to switch it over to being real estate specific. When we talk about the market, the market is a big impact, uh, has a big impact on our business. And so, um, it's easier to ride a wave than it is to make one. So if we say, um, you know, six months ago, it was a super strong sellers market. We wanted to get those sellers. We wanted to be part of, um, what was going to sell. We always want to sell. We always want sellers. We always want to focus on sellers, but as it shifts to more of a buyer's market, remember we talked about, it's not quite a buyer's market yet. It's still a seller's market because it's still lower inventory. However, as it shifts, we want to shift with it because it's easier to ride a wave than it is to make one. And so we want to be shifting with that market and saying, okay, so if the market is shifting and it's starting to be more um, easier for buyers to get into, to get an offer accepted, then we want to make that shift. And we want to start really pushing those buyers and saying, hey, buyers, let's jump on board right now because we want them to ride the wave too. So it's easier to ride a wave than it is to make one. Any thoughts on all of this? Some of these? Let me see. I want to um, go down to some of these. Selling. So for selling, um, ask for feedback to sell. If you want more money, ask for advice. If you want advice, ask for money. <laughs> um, I actually love that because this, I have found this to be so true. So if you want money, ask for advice. So you should be surrounding yourself. And I don't know, I, I know that this is one of the things they talked about. I don't know if this is one we've touched on, but, um, you know, you are the, you are the average of the five people you spend the most time with. You should be surrounding yourself with those five people who are going to lift you up. Um, and so one of those things that you always want to make sure that you're surrounding yourself with people who have um, more successful businesses than you and have more money than you and have more, you know, whatever it is, you want to surround yourself with people like that. And you want to talk to them and ask them for advice. You want to ask for feedback. And so I always am talking to people around me who are very successful saying, Hey, what made you successful? What gave you this idea? What do you think is important in this market? What are you looking at right now? What are you thinking about? What is your next step? And you want to get that advice. And when you ask for that advice, the money will come. Um, 
Don't try to sell what you wouldn't buy. This is a good one. I like this one. Don't try and sell what you wouldn't buy. Now, keep in mind that this is not saying um, if you wouldn't buy a house, don't sell it to somebody. Because for some people, uh, the perfect house is a major fixer upper where you would not ever touch it. So think, you know, don't be saying like, oh, I wouldn't buy this. But if it's something that you say, you know, it just doesn't seem like a great investment. It's just not something. Don't be trying to push something that's totally overpriced on somebody just because you want to make a sale. Um, confidence is palpable. Potential customers will know if you believe in what you're selling. So if you're saying to your customer, oh, or to your client, this is a great deal because uh, you're never going to get something like this again, but it's not really true. First of all, don't do that. <laughs> You are the fiduciary to your client, so don't do that. But um, you want to make sure that you're you're telling them that this is a good deal because you believe it's a good deal. So they're allowed to buy something even if you don't think it's a good deal, as long as you've told them here's here's what I'm saying. Here are pros and cons. Here's what here's what I see as a real estate professional. So don't try and sell what you wouldn't buy. We're not sleazy salespeople. I was listening to something the other day that was saying, we want, um, we want our clients to think of us more as a financial planner where, you know, when we, when somebody has a financial advisor, they're like puffing up their shoulders. Like, yeah, I have a financial advisor. That's what we want people to think of us as rather than a sleazy used car salesman. We do not want people to think of us as used car salesmen because that's not what we are. We are more of an advisor. We want them to be um, like they're, they have their attorney, they have their uh, financial advisor, and they have their real estate professional. They have their real estate expert who is going to help them in all of their real estate needs. So um, just make sure that when you come, when you come from contribution and you're confident in what you're uh, trying to sell them, which is a house or um, trying to sell them on an investment property or trying to sell them on the idea of buying real estate is good for them, you have to believe that and you have to know that that is true. And we do believe that as real estate professionals, you should believe that real estate is the best investment and it is going to be valuable for all of your clients. Um, deliver value and build trust before you try to sell. Trust saves time, right? Right. Write great content and offer a free trial. So that's part of what we talk about is in our business con or our buyer consultations or listing consultations. It's kind of like offering a free trial. We're saying, hey, this is all we have to offer you. We are going to be, um, we're going to deliver that value before we ever ask you to pay for anything. So uh, being a real estate agent is definitely delivering that value. But even when we talk about coming from contribution and like we talked about with the open house thing, if we're saying, hey, um, I want to offer you a, like a, a free course on something on how to interview your real estate agent or a free sample of some kind of document about <laughs> offering value. I can't think of it right now, but whatever we were trying to offer them value that is, uh, delivering value before you're trying to sell them on anything. So I, I do love that idea. And I think that that is very good advice. Um, have a rejection goal. I loved this one. Each no moves you closer to your goal. Flip the psychology of selling, um, have a rejection goal. So if we talk about saying, oh, I have a goal to, um, have, you know, two, two appointments this week, that means that we're going to be rejected by probably 20 people. So if we have a rejection goal set, that just means that you're talking to as many people. Remember, it's a numbers game. Each no moves you closer to your goal. If you think about it in that way, you're not going to be afraid of that rejection. You're not going to be afraid of saying um, that they said no, or we don't want to, you know, they don't want to work with me or whatever. You're not going to be afraid of that rejection because you know that each no moves you closer to, to your goal. What we say is no stands for next opportunity. We just brush it off and keep going. And if we have a rejection goal, we say, yes, that hit us closer to our goal. So um, think about it in that way, flip it on its head and really be going after that rejection. All right, 
I'm not going to read the rest of it uh, because I am running out of time, but I want you guys to read through this, especially the success part. Don't self-reject. Don't tell yourself no before someone else can. I think a lot of us do this in real estate, especially in the beginning. We say, oh, uh, nobody's going to want that. Nobody's going to want to talk to me. Nobody's going to want to work with me, blah, blah, blah. Don't self-reject. Some, let somebody else do that. Get that. Uh, have your goal for your rejections. Don't do, don't tell yourself no before somebody else can. So anyway, I want you to read through these because it's obviously a quick, easy read, but, um, do look at this and have some of these things that are really poignant for you and put them up, write them somewhere. We thrive in niches, specialize, whatever it is. Um, follow up. This can yield dividends like we talked about earlier today. So, this is super, I thought this was super, um, helpful in our conversations right now around real estate. And so if you have things that you are, um, feeling like you're kind of dejected or feeling like you are needing some motivation, read through those. And like I said, post them up on your wall, put them as your desktop, uh, background, do something so that you are getting motivated through some of these things, because this is like tried and tested, tried and true, uh, stuff. All right. Feedback. Any comments? What do you guys think? Anything that stood out to you? I have a comment when you said, like, just read what you enjoy. I'm thinking about the MRI book and the, <laughs> the other, the red book. And I don't really enjoy those books, but I have to read it. Well, true. But also, are you going to enjoy the outcome? Are you going to enjoy being a successful agent? Are you going to enjoy being a successful real estate investor? Yes. Um, also, I rather I mean, enjoy listening to you than reading that book. How about reading it? How about listening to the audiobook? That might be easier. But, you know, like it could be that kind of thing where it's like the idea is just enjoy. But also, if you're like, I, I really don't enjoy this, don't read it. Listen to it or come to classes or watch YouTube videos or get the information in some way that you enjoy. What else? I like your don't self-reject. Don't reject yourself before someone else can. Yeah, I liked that too. I hear that a lot in especially new agents feeling like they don't have confidence. They don't have the know-how. They don't have, you know, whatever. That's part of why we do Ignite. That's part of why we do our Kickstart series. That's why we do a lot of these things because we know the more knowledge you have as a new agent, the more confidence you have. And that's really what the key is when you're talking to people um, and trying to win their business is having that confidence. And so we try and say, here's a lot of knowledge so that you can gain that confidence. But the, the key is really just do, going out there and doing it. Pick up the phone, make those calls. You're going to gain confidence over time because you're going to say, no, it wasn't really that bad. Seek and out that to, rejection. You need to do it. Just the previous industry is in for a long time advertising. Salespeople would say, I'm not walking in there because they're not going to buy it anyway. And I used to say, how do you know? I mean, you've never been there. So it's just a, and we all do it in sales. It's a way to just keep us from being embarrassed or whatever. And once you can break through that barrier, which is not easy to do sometimes, it gets easier as time goes by. Yep, exactly. It gets easier the more you do it. The more you realize, okay, I was rejected and that sucked, but I'm still here. My life has not ended. <laughs> I think the more you do that, the more you see that, the more confidence it builds and the more you're willing to pick up the phone and just do it. So that is the key is to just do it. Pick up the phone and just do it. I also like your, uh, when you said like, ask for top agent, like what makes you successful? I actually started to ask some top agent in my area, but they don't really have the time for me, but I will be persistent. <laughs> and, and some of that too might be like, when you are in a list, you know, in a transaction with somebody, then they might be more willing to give you some of those tips and tricks when they're actually working with you rather than if they're, you know, busy going, doing other things. So, you know, like keep asking, I, I agree, just keep talking to them and keep asking because you are going to find people, especially all of our um, Keller Williams have the ALC, which is the um, leadership committee. And if you reach out to those people, those people are um, 
wanting to help. They are wanting to give, you know, feedback and they're successful agents in our, in our businesses. So, um, they would be good ones to reach out to. Oh, I didn't even know about this ALC. <laughs> I have yeah. to ask my coordinator. Yeah. All right. Well, it's 1232. I want you guys to be able to get back to your days. Um, so thanks for coming and we will see you in your group coachings later today. Bye guys. Thank you.